Hello everyone. So today I will be discussing NHS logistics, which means that I will tell you in detail about the basic framework of the NHS, what are the different level of cares, um, what a GP practice does, and how referral works in the NHS. So this knowledge is really important for you to be confident in exam because knowledge is confidence. And when you know about the role of each particular person or each particular department and how things work and how are the referrals and uh, other systems in the NHS, then you will be, uh, you will appear really confident while providing management to your patient. Okay, so let's discuss uh, in detail. Okay, so the first level of care, like every other healthcare service, the first level of care in NHS is primary care, then secondary care, and then tertiary care. What is included in the primary care? So primary care include um, general practice, community pharmacy, and optometry. Okay, these three these three uh, you know departments are the first point of contact for the patient. So general practice is basically um, what we call as GP GP practice. Um, this is basically a doctor's clinic. Um, it also have some other member of the staff. We will discuss that in detail. But it is this is what is at the center or at the heart of the NHS. Then we have community pharmacy. Um, community pharmacy has a pharmacist and people can go for minor um, you know, minor symptoms to the pharmacy, minor symptoms like, for example, um, someone is experiencing allergic symptoms, so they, will, so they will go to the community pharmacy and the pharmacist can then prescribe uh, antihistamines to them or you know, antifungal shampoo or medicated soaps, etc. They can be provided, they can be prescribed by the pharmacist without uh, prescription by the doctor, okay? And then we have optometry. So optometry is the first point of contact for eye health services. So if anyone is experiencing any symptoms in the eye, they will first go to the optometry. The optometry will check their, the optometrist will check their uh, vision, their visual field, visual equity, um, pressure in their eye. And if the condition, if there, this is something, uh, if it's something that the optometrist can treat, like for example, um, if it's myopia, then they will give prescription eye glasses. But if it's beyond their domain, then they will refer to the ophthalmologist or GP, okay? All right, now secondary care is basically care at a hospital. So it can be uh, emergency, urgent and emergency care, including the 999, which are basically the ambulance services, 999 or triple one. Ambulance services, or it can be a planned or elective care at a hospital. So for example, if a person has pneumonia and he's treated for pneumonia at the hospital, then this is called a secondary care. And also psychiatry, which are mental health services, it also comes under secondary care. Tertiary care, it refers to uh, highly specialized services like neurosurgery, plastic surgery, orthopedic, interventional cardiology, forensic psychiatry. So these basically are tertiary care services and they're also inside, you know, they're also inside a hospital. So secondary and tertiary care are both inside a hospital, but tertiary care are high specialized services and they may not be available in every uh, in every hospital, okay? All right, uh, now let's discuss general practice, which is really important, okay? So general practice, our GP is, it's the main and the primary point of contact for general health care for patients, okay? General practice is basically, they're basically uh, small buildings and they have MGT teams, multidisciplinary teams. So a team at general practice will include GPs who are doctors and then nurses, physiotherapists, receptionists, and also pharmacists, okay? So inside one building, there may be you know, two GPs or three GPs, depending upon the population. And uh, GPs are basically doctors who are trained for three years in general practice. Okay? So it's a three years training program. It's in some countries of the world, GP means uh, someone who has only done their MBBS and um, you know their uh, internship and they are not trained in any specialty. But in UK, uh, GP training is uh, a three-year training program. In some of the others, a four-year training program. And these doctors are updated in different specialties and uh, they have their own exit exam. And um, they are then uh, qualified as GPs. So each GP, um, G, so the GP is also known as, you know, the, uh, the general practice is also sometimes called as GP surgery. So the building is sometimes called as GP surgery, but no surgeries are done inside these buildings, okay? So, you know, um, this is a common misconception, so I thought that I will clear this up. Um, okay, so each GP practice is specific catchment area. 
so in uk uh, the whole country is divided into council areas and inside each council area there may be uh, two gp uh, two gp practices or three gp practices depending upon the population and uh, each gp practice will have a specific catchment area so for example one gp practice might have 200 households so in these 200 household every single person whether a child or an adult or an elderly person will be registered with uh, with that GP, okay? And that GP is responsible for maintaining the entire medical record of the patient and they will follow this patient up throughout their lifetime, okay? Unless the patient relocates somewhere else. All right. Um, okay, so how do you get an appointment with the GP? So for example, if somebody is experiencing any symptom, they will call the GP reception, receptionist and the receptionists are also trained uh, to ask a few questions, you know, to try edge your symptoms and to direct you to the right member of the team. Because remember, inside the GP practice, there are also nurses and nurses can, you know, do some tasks like administer um, administer vaccines or, you know, do a pap smear. So they will ask you a few questions. They will direct you either towards the nurse or towards the GP. Okay, so they will give you an appointment either with the nurse or with the GP, okay? Now, what a GP can do for you? A GP can treat all common medical conditions, okay? Unless the patient condition is, uh, you know, acute, the patient is acutely unwell, right? So they can treat all common medical conditions, like all the infections, all common infections. Um, they can treat conditions like um, sprain or migraine, tension headache, depression, um, hypertension, unless the patient condition warrants referral to uh, your specialist services or emergency services, okay? So, for example, um, let's take an example of pneumonia. So, for example, if a patient with pneumonia presents to a GP, the GP will calculate CURB 65 score. So, if the CURB 65 score is 0, um, 0 or 1, then the patient will be given oral antibiotics, okay, and uh, will be treated in the community. But if the patient CURB 60, uh, 65 score is uh, 2 or above, then he will be referred to the hospital and will be treated at the hospital. Okay? For example, if the patient has um, amthalitis or sore throat, then he will be given oral antibiotics. But if the patient has a condition is so severe that he is septic, then he will be referred to the hospital. Okay. For example, if a patient with uh, depression present to the GP and he has mild depression or moderate depression, then he will be treated by the GP. A GP will start him on antidepressant, but if his condition is so severe that he's actively suicidal, then he will be referred to the hospital. So if the patient condition is really severe and the patient is acutely unwell, then those patients are referred to the emergency department and otherwise they are treated by the GP. Okay. GP can also refer to specialized services. So there are some conditions that GP cannot diagnose and treat. For example, if a child with autism, suspected autism, presents to GP, GP cannot diagnose autism on its own and even refer to autism assessment services. Similarly, there are ADHD assessment services. Services If a patient presents with a history of fit, if a patient is taken to the GP surgery and he tells the GP that he has had a fit in the morning, he will be referred to the first fit clinic. Okay. So referral to the specialized services is also the job of the GP. So GP basically directs patient towards uh, appropriate medical specialty. Okay. They also do follow up of chronic medical conditions. So for example, if someone has diabetes or hypertension or COPD or any heart condition, then they will follow up with the GP um, for their medications and for the control of their um, condition. Okay. They also offer screening services like cervical cancer screening, pap smear for cervical cancer screening, blood pressure screening, etc. They also provide contraceptive advice and also do vaccinations. Okay. So now what are the limitations uh, at GP surgery? So GP, GP surgery or GP practices, uh, you can think about them as hospital clean, uh, sorry, as doctor's clinics. Okay. Doctor clinics in the community. So they don't have any special diagnostic services in the building. They don't have any x-ray. They don't have any ultrasound facility. They they do have um, you know ECG facilities, the portable ECG machine, but they don't have anything else like x-ray or ultrasound. 
there is no lab inside the GP uh, the GP practice, so you know they cannot immediately get blood test results. GP uh, GP surgery they can take the blood. So for example, if a patient presents to a GP with complaint of for example tiredness, and GP can what GP can do is he can take the uh, targeted history. He can do examination and uh, you know uh, come up with two or three differential diagnoses. But then he needs to do blood test as well to you know um, diagnose the condition. So what he will do, he will uh, request some blood tests and the phlebotomist at the GP's practice will take blood from the patient and collect the blood sample, label them with the patient name and uh, the patient NHS number. But uh, the blood sample will be stored at the GP practice. At the end of the day, um, all the blood samples of the patients those are see that are seen by the GP uh, during that day, they will that they, they they will be, you know, uh, transported um, at the end of the day to the hospital laboratory and then the laboratory will, uh, again, they, they will do the blood tests and then the results will then be sent to the GP surgery. So this whole process will take maybe two to three days or maybe a week or more. Once the GP surgeon receives the blood uh, results, then they will call the patient that we have received your results and they will give an appointment for the, uh, the patient to discuss the blood test results with them and to start the unappropriate treatment. Okay. So there are no immediate blood test facilities. So any condition that required immediate blood test to be done, the patient will be referred to the hospital, okay? So no urgent and emergency care can be provided at the GP surgery, okay? Those patients will be referred to the A. They cannot give any IV medication or IV fluids. Again, these patients will be referred to the hospital if they need any IV medication or IV fluids, okay? The patient need any special, you know, a special diagnostic service like X-ray or ultrasound. They will again be referred to the hospital. Okay, for immediate blood test, they will be referred to the hospital. Now there are certain prescribing limitation as well, and this is a big point, of, you know, a big point of debate among the blood two candidates: what a GP can prescribe and what a GP can not prescribe. It is a bit complex, but for simplicity purposes. GP can prescribe green drugs. So in the UK, the medications are classified as green, amber, and red. And this is known as the traffic light, uh, traffic light system of drugs or something like that. So drugs are classified into green, amber, and red. Green drugs are those that can be started at the GP practice. Okay, and they are uh, common medications. Common medications like oral antibiotics. Um, painkillers like paracetamol. Paracetamol, by the way, is also available over the counter in superstores as well, but NSAIDs like ibuprofen, they are not available over the counter. So painkillers, anti-inflammatory contraceptives, antidepressants like SSRIs, SNRIs, anxiolytic medications, again, like SNRI or benzodiazepine, antihypertensive, the oral antihypertensive, oral hypoglycemic medication, metformin, insulin, um, beta blockers, thyroxine, they can be prescribed by the GP. Okay, this list is not conclusive. There are other, other medications as well that can be prescribed by the GP. You know, they can be started by the GP. But these are some of the common medication that I thought I should list here. Now, what the GP cannot prescribe? So, amber and red drugs, they cannot be prescribed by the GP. I mean, they cannot be independently prescribed by the GP. Now, amber, drug, uh, amber drugs are those that uh, need to be initiated and maintained by the specialist. But once patient is stabilized on these medications, then they can be transferred to the general practice. So, for example, this means that, uh, for example, a patient who is diagnosed with, um, for example, the GP suspect that this patient is SLE. He will refer this patient to the rheumatologist. The rheumatologist will further confirm the diagnosis of SLE and he will start the patient on um, medications, immunosuppressant medication. For example, the patient is started on myofibrillar morphitin. Okay. So once the patient is started on myofibrillar morphitin, he will be followed up by the specialist. And once the patient is stabilized on that medication and there is good response to it, then 
a specialist will you know um, write a letter to the GP that this patient is this patient has been diagnosed with SLE and um, he's been on this dose of mycofenvirimofetil and his response is good and you know that letter will be sent to the GP so any further prescription that this patient need he will get from the GP and the GP will also you know at every visit the GP will also evaluate his symptoms and whether they are controlled or not and um, he will also monitor for any side effect of the medication and will continue giving further prescription for this drug unless there is any problem or the patient condition patient is experiencing severe flares a patient is experiencing any flare or any side effect then he will again refer the patient for specialist advice okay so these are basically amber drugs similarly if patient is you know, uh, diagnosed with if the gp suspect that the patient has uh, bipolar disorder he will refer the patient to the psychiatrist for diagnosis the psychiatrist will confirm the diagnosis of bipolar disorder and will start the patient on lithium okay and will follow up the patient uh, and see the response of patient to the lithium and will also monitor the blood level of lithium. Once the patient condition is stabilized on lithium and the blood level of lithium are stabilized, then the pres further prescription respons responsibility will be shifted to the general practice. Further prescription the patient will get from the GP. The GP at each visit will give the uh, will give the new prescription, um, will evaluate the patient's symptom and also monitor for any side effect. So I hope this is clear. And then there are red drugs. So red drugs can only be prescribed by specialists and they can never be transferred to the GP. The reason for this is that either the monitoring is too, you know, they require either um, monitor, severe, you know, monitoring, close monitoring, or uh, which cannot be practical at the general practice. Okay. So what are the uh, amber drugs? Amber drugs are basically parenteral antibiotics, IV antibiotics that cannot be started on uh, GP can never give IV antibiotics for GP surgery. Then immunomodulators, cancer chemotherapy. Cancer chemotherapy, I suppose, will be a red drug because GP can never give, give cancer chemotherapy. Cancer uh, chemotherapy should always be given inside of hospital. So immunomodulator medications, hormonal therapy, like uh, growth hormone, testosterone, etc. No, hormonal uh, medications are contraceptives are also hormonal medication, but GP can give those medications, but not uh, hormones like growth hormone or testosterone. Now, uh, an interesting point is that GP can start the patient on thyroxine. If a, if a patient is a hypothyroid, he can be started on thyroxine by the GP. Okay, but if the patient is hyperthyroid, then the GP cannot start him on carbidazole. The GP can only start him on beta blockers. Um, to control the symptoms of hyperthyroidism, but he cannot start carbamazole and he has to refer the patient to the specialist uh, in order to start the antithyroid medication. Also, the GP in psychiatry, uh, for example, the GP can prescribe antidepressant medication like SSRI, and he can prescribe enzyretic medication like SNRI or benzodiazepine, but he cannot prescribe these specialized medication like antipsychotics, lithium, ADHD medication. They cannot be prescribed by the GP. Okay, so uh, yeah, so for example, a GP can prescribe oral iron, but he cannot prescribe IV iron because GP cannot prescribe any IV, so the IV uh, medication. So you have to think about, you know, uh, think about in each one case and if it's a common medication, uh, common condition, then GP can prescribe it. It's a highly specialized drug, then of course, you need to refer the patient to the specialist for diagnostic, you know, for the confirmation of diagnosis and for uh, the initiation of treatment. So that was all about what a GP can and cannot prescribe. I hope it makes some sense to you now. Um, let's talk about the referrals now. How referral works. So referrals are basically for four types. As I already told you, GP is the first point of contact for each patient. The GP can then further refer. So referrals are then further classified into immediate referral, which are for basically any patient, acutely and well patient, they are immediately referred to the hospital. Either by calling ambulance or the patient has phone transport uh, or whatever, but the referral is immediate, there and then. Okay, then there are some referrals which are same day referral. So the patient uh, needs to be seen within 24 hours. An example for this is uh, patients with transient ischemic attack. They need to be referred to the TIE clinic in the hospital within 24 hours. Okay. 
Then urgent referrals. Urgent referrals are, for example, for suspected cancer patients. And those patients are seen within two weeks. And then there are routine referrals. Uh, and routine referrals may take from one month to four months. Okay. So that was all about the basic structure of NHS. I hope it's clear to you now. And if you have any questions that you can ask in the comments. And if you like this video, then please give us a thumb up, thumbs up or sub subscribe this channel. If you haven't already subscribed. Um, so I hope it was helpful and I will see you soon.